So we are in lecture number eight at the moment. We are kind of changing topics today. We have been, uh, I have been talking for about three weeks about uh, uh, different analysis techniques, um, quant qualitative analysis techniques like waste analysis and value area analysis, and also uh, quantitative analysis techniques, like for example, um, a, a quantitative analysis technique like flow analysis or queuing theory. Uh, and you are about to complete a homework about these uh, topics. Uh, and we're gonna move already now to the next topic, which is like, imagine I have done all these beautiful analyses and now I would like to exploit the output of this analysis. So we are gonna focus on this next phase of the process management life cycle called process redesign. And the purpose of process redesign is to take all these insights that you derive from your analysis. Like for example, you notice some very large waiting times in some part of your process, uh, or you notice that there is a bit of inefficiency, some waste happening in some parts, in some steps of your process and uh, and uh, or customers are complaining about something about your process like for example complaining about wrong deliveries or uh, other types of defects and you want to to study what's uh, to 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 redesign the process in order to address those issues that the customers are experiencing So you are <clears throat> so so what we're going to do today is techniques for taking the output of the analysis you have done and coming up with ideas on how to improve the process. Uh, this uh, is, is covered in chapter eight of the textbook, which I have shared with you uh, via the Slack channel book chapters. The purpose of process redesign is very simple. <clears throat> we have a process and of course we want to improve it. Uh, business process management is often about continuously looking at your process, continuously looking for wastes, um, non-value adding steps, uh, a, a look, talking to different stakeholders, like for example, customers, but also process workers, identifying issues and coming up with ideas on how to resolve it. Uh, and these ideas allow us to go from like the as is process, every time I say as is process, it means the process as it is, to the to be process. Uh, a to be process where we have made some changes. Typical changes could be, for example, to automate an activity. Uh, another type of change could be to, to eliminate an activity, not to execute an activity or to reorder some activities or to parallelize some activities. And this week and next week, we're just gonna see a bunch of templates or methods to come up with ideas on how to improve the process in order to address different types of performance issues. Uh, I'll give you some sort of guidelines or recipes on how to do this, but bear in mind that this is a lot about creativity. So you have to also, when you get to redesign, you have to take away your analytic hat and put a bit your creative hat and just come up with creative ways of improving your process. Maybe doing something completely different that was being done before. Um, taking advantage of, of advances in technology, but also just uh, uh, looking at uh, the root causes of the problems that your customers are reporting and trying to address those root causes. There are roughly in the field of business process management, there are many dozens of these approaches or methods for business process redesign. Uh, they can be roughly classified into two categories. Uh, exploitative redesign and explorative redesign. So sounds like very big words, it's kind of very simple. Exploitative means that you have an existing business process and you try to make the best out of it by improving it incrementally. So you take, I'm not gonna completely change the process, I'm just gonna improve the process in some corners, in some specific points of the process. The other approach for business process redesign is to go completely transformational, to put into question 
all the assumptions that you are making in your process, in your process structure, and to look for breakthrough innovation. So you are going to say, my process is kind of completely broken. Let's is, is a very good time to just completely redesign it almost from scratch in a way that will better serve the customers. Uh, it's a trade-off with explorative redesign. You can address very challenging issues, but it can also, it, it, it causes a lot of disruption in your business. And, and many managers, rightly so, don't like too much disruption. So it's very difficult to convince management to do explorative redesign. So sometimes you have to do exploitative redesign. You have to say, I'm not going to make big changes. I'm not going to make a big bang. I'm just going to propose very specific changes to the process while keeping the structure. It's not like it's one approach or the other. I mean, you need to be aware of both of them. And if you are in a team that is trying to come up with ideas to improve a process, you have to consider both options. You know, Maybe propose an option with a lot of change and propose another option with a little bit of change. So both approaches, explorative, you know, just break the process and exploitative, keep the process and tune it. Both approaches are actually useful. So I will present you one method of the second type first and one method of the first type in the next lesson next week. So today I'm going to give you a a brief introduction to a method for um, a redesigning processes in a transformational way, in a way that really breaks the current structure of the process and puts in place a new structure that is more driven towards the customer needs. And it's called Business Process Reengineering, BPR. It's a transformative approach, as I just said. It puts into questions like, we have an assist process, but it's broken, so we're going to come up with a completely blank sheet and redesign a new process. And at the same time, while being transformative, it's very analytical. It's based on some very clear principles. You read those principles, you understand those principles, you look at your business process, and you try to come up with ways of making the process follow those principles. Uh, so the, to, to, to give you a, um, an initial understanding of what this method is about, I'm going to put it into the context in which it was developed. So BPR, historically, is a pretty old technique. It comes from, it was developed in the late 80s, beginning of 90s. So when some of you were born. And it was developed in the context of large uh, organizations. Uh, typically, that's where you have like very broken processes that need very substantial redesign. Was developed in very large organizations, where, in particular, uh, at Ford, uh, where they were having some very fundamental, very nasty uh, performance processes in several processes across the board. So, just to illustrate, one of the processes that inspired business process redesign was Ford's procurement process. Remember, procurement process is the process by which a company buys materials or services from other companies. It's a purchasing process. Ford was in a situation where the procurement process had become pretty much unmanageable. Um, it's, it was very expensive, and they were in a situation where they needed to cut costs across the whole company. Uh, so it was the first place where the executive managers would look like we need to cut costs. It cannot be that buying stuff, not paying for the stuff, but actually just running the process of buying stuff is costing us so much. It also was a very slow process where cases just got stuck everywhere. So they needed to do this process faster. With They needed to reduce the cycle times, also called turnaround times of the process. And they needed to do this process better. So they needed to reduce the defect rates of the process. Just to give you an idea, this process was mainly, not only, but mainly being run by a department in the company um, consisting of more than 500 people in North America alone. Uh, so 500 people 
just hang, you know, doing work in order to ensure that Ford could purchase materials for its factories and for its offices and other stuff like that. Um, that's quite a lot of people, even in a large company, just to buy things. And the turnaround times for, despite the fact that they had 500 people, um, which is like a massive workforce in terms of the amount of resource capacity you have in there, uh, the, the turnaround times, meaning the cycle times for handling purchase orders and invoices coming from the suppliers of Ford, those who sell all the raw material for building cars, was in the order of weeks, meaning there was this vendor who sells to Ford, uh, for example, some metal sheets that are used to build part of the cars. And this uh, company, when they send the invoice to Ford, they were waiting for many weeks before they get paid a simple invoice. And, and oftentimes it was happening that the invoice was not paid in time. Every invoice has a due date and the invoices were not paid in time. And when invoices are not paid in time, then the company that doesn't pay, in this case, in this case Ford, has to pay a late payment penalty. So Ford was, in addition, incurring a lot of late payment penalties, despite having more than 500 people dedicated to their, in their accounts payable department, meaning dedicated to handling inbound invoices. So they, they hired a, um, a very well-known um, consultancy company, a big one, uh, that analyzed their uh, procurement process from the perspective of automation. So their idea was like, we can see that there are many manual tasks being performed and then new technology, you know, at the time, um, a, some sorts of three, you know, like optical character recognition in the early days, uh, combine it with some a, a intelligent so-called expert system. It's a sort of artificial intelligence system to do matching between invoices and purchase orders automatically that that system could automate some of the tasks in the process that were taking the longest amount of processing time and therefore uh, reduce the requirements for so many employees. And they concluded after doing a very detailed study, I mean, these studies are quite detailed. So you have analysts, you know, very carefully looking at what will be automated, how much time will be saved, how many people are involved, how much cost can be reduced. They concluded that realistically, this automation project could improve the performance of Ford's procure to pay process by 20%, could reduce cost by 20%. But Ford decided not to launch this automation project. And it was not because the technology was not there to automate the process. You know, there was already some well-tested technology that had been tested in other settings that could automate some steps in the procurement process of Ford. It was not because Ford lacked the internal capacity to absorb that technology. They had already absorbed similar technology, very advanced technology, even in other parts of the organization, uh, for example, for you know, managing their supply chain, their demand, etc. So they, they, they did have that capacity. It was not because there was not enough uh, 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 digitalization at Ford uh, and computer literate employees. Ford had made some investments into digitalization at the top. Uh, uh, before this, this, this uh, case study uh, happened in the late 80s. So it was none of the above. It was the following. At the time, Ford as a company had just acquired other companies, including a company that used to be called Mazda. Mazda nowadays, I think it's a type of car, a brand of car that doesn't exist anymore. It was actually quite common at the time. It was a Japanese automaker that had grown tremendously um, from the, during the 70s and 80s and had become a viable competitor of American automakers. You know, generally Japanese automakers had become quite competitive in the market, be it Toyota or, uh, or, or Mazda or Subaru, etc. cetera. Uh, and when Ford acquired Mazda, they 
started to study. So their executives, Ford's executives, started to study the business processes at Mazda. And they found, to their big surprise, that Mazda's accounts payable team, it was not a department, it was just a team, consisted of 15 people. So there was a company, sure, it was only about one quarter of the size of, of Ford, but still, what was being done by more than 500 people at Ford was being done by 15 people at Mazda. So even after accounting for the fact that Ford as a company was much larger than Mazda, Ford was spending, uh, was dedicating about six to seven times more resources, human resources, to handling purchase orders and invoices than the competitor that they just, just had bought. So they, they went into a clean sheet mode and they said, let's have in a clean sheet mode a look at how I am performing the process. So they somehow mapped the process, not necessarily in a BPMA notation, but in some simpler notations. And they started brainstorming what is going on here. So they figure out that when somebody at Ford, like an engineer, needed to buy something, that someone will give a phone call to a purchasing officer. Everybody in the organization had some purchasing officer nearby, maybe in the same building, in the same floor, that was rep responsible for all purchases. So if I am superintendent in a factory and I discover that I'm running low of some type of screws, then I will urgently call the purchasing department or the purchasing person and says, we need to buy this and this amount and I need them by Friday uh, morning. Uh, the purchasing department will then send a purchase order. They will prepare. So we're talking about late 80s. So it was not that there was not the internet, the web everywhere. So, but they, they had these computer mainframes. The purchasing agent will go into the computer mainframes and create a purchase order, record the purchase order in the internal system, and it will produce a purchase order document, and it will fax it to the vendor. At the time, you didn't send by email, you faxed. But never mind, it's a technology that works as well. Uh, the vendor will receive the purchase order. They will process it in their internal system. And at some point in time, uh, by the way, at the same time, the purchasing department will send a copy of the purchase order to the accounts payable department by internal mail. So it will take a, like a day or two to arrive, but it didn't matter because accounts payable department in principle did not need that purchase order straight away. So they will just send a copy of the, the purchase order from purchasing department to accounts payable department. Accounts payable department, uh, so eventually, eventually, not the same day, maybe three days later, say on Friday morning, the vendor will arrive at the warehouse of Ford. And there were many warehouses, they say at the warehouse that corresponded and they will deposit the goods. So it was usually not the vendor themselves that delivered, it was usually a transportation company, but never mind. the vendor, you know, delivered the goods to a transportation company, the transportation company through all their logistic services went to deliver and the truck driver would just like grab some signature on a document called a delivery receipt to make sure that Ford acknowledges that this amount of screwdrivers, screwdrivers have been delivered. Then this document called a delivery receipt will be grabbed from the warehouse and it will be sent to accounts payable by internal mail. Well, they usually kept a copy and they sent a copy to accounts payable. So at this stage, the goods have been received, the products that were purchased have been received. Accounts payable have, has in principle a copy of the purchase order with the amount of the products, the description of the products, and the price to be paid. And accounts payable will then um, send, uh, will have a copy of the delivery receipt. So accounts payable had a proof 
that the products have been received. At this point in time, when the goods have been received and the accounts that the delivery receipt is available at the accounts payable department, eventually the vendor will send an invoice. However, you know how invoicing works. You, if you are a vendor and you sell lots of stuff to forward, you don't necessarily send one invoice for that every little thing you send to Ford, you sell to Ford. You usually send like a weekly invoice uh, or maybe a couple of invoices a week or three invoices a month, etc. And in every invoice, you will invoice for several products, not for one single product. And therefore, there is a very potentially very arbitrary relation between invoices, deliveries, and purchase orders. Sometimes an invoice refers to 10 purchase orders. Sometimes an invoice refers to products that were delivered over a period of 10 different days. So it refers to several delivery receipts. Sometimes an invoice will be, will correspond, will match exactly one purchase order, but sometimes a purchase order is delivered in multiple steps. If you have ever bought something in, an, in, in, in Amazon, for example, you sometimes have a choice of saying, uh, this product is already ready, so please deliver it to me straight away. The other product will come later, no worries. So sometimes the same order is delivered in multiple deliveries. What is available straight away is delivered straight away. What is not yet available is delivered a, a couple of weeks later. So sometimes one purchase order corresponds to two deliveries. And then maybe it corresponds to two or three invoices, uh, depending. So, so th there's a very nasty relation there between invoices, receiving documents, also called delivery receipts, and purchase orders. And account payable was spending an insane amount of time trying to find out, given an invoice that I just received, find out the corresponding purchase orders and the corresponding deliveries so that they could check that indeed this invoice is correct and has been paid because that's the job of accounts payable is to make sure that we only pay for what we have received and ordered. So then there you are, you have hundreds of people trying to find out what invoice corresponds to what purchase order and which receiving document? Obviously, when they found the right invoice, the, the right purchase order and the right receiving documents, it was not a problem. The problem is what happens if we don't find them? So you have to give a phone call to the vendor. You have to give a phone call to the warehouse. You have to give a phone call to the purchasing officer who maybe has to give a phone call to the original uh, buyer to figure out have we actually received the products corresponding to this invoice? Why is it that the purchase order says one price and the invoice says another price? What, where is this discrepancy coming from? Or why is it that here the order says that we ordered 10 boxes of something and the invoice says we ordered 20 boxes of something? Sometimes it's a mistake. Sometimes it turns out that yes, um, the purchasing officer sent a new purchase order for another 10 of those boxes. So it's normal that the invoice says 20 boxes because there were two purchase orders for 10 boxes each. Uh, eventually, eventually all these issues got resolved, but only after several days or several weeks have passed by and the accounts payable department will send the payment to the vendor for the corresponding invoice or in some cases it will reject the invoice, it will have it revised, and they will pay the revised version of the invoice. So then they said, wow, this is the, the madness here comes from the fact that we are spending so much time matching invoices with delivery receipts and with purchase orders. And they said, what can we do to tackle this? Um, and of course, part of the problem 
comes from a lack of digitization of this process. You have paper purchase orders, you have paper del delivery receipts on paper, and you have invoices on paper, and matching stuff, stuff on paper is a complete, um, is complete nonsense. I mean, this is super time consuming. So part of it is the automation. But there is another problem in this process, and it's the fact that all the problems, all the defects that might happen in the process, for example, a, a wrong invoice, a double invoice, um, an invoice for some product that has not yet been delivered, etc. all those problems are being left until the end of the process. So, so Ford came with a clean sheet design and said, let us see how this process could look ideally so that we deliver on the outcome of the process, which is to pay the fair amount that we have to pay to every supplier for their invoices. So how can to do it promptly? So how can we do that? So the first thing was the, to address the lack of digitization of the process, to replace these paper invoices floating internally at Ford with some electronic record keeping. Uh, so the purchase order, the purchasing department, instead of uh, entering data into a lock, into a mainframe and keeping the data to themselves, then printing the invoice and send it to accounts payable, uh, sending a copy of the invoice or, or of the purchase order, sorry, to accounts payable, they will just store the record of the purchase order in the database. Uh, that was databases, relational databases became actually very um, widespread in the 1980s, and there's a company that was became very famous at the time called Oracle, which was a, a, a maker of uh, a relational databases for enterprise settings. Um, so the technology, the database technology was already quite mature. And so Ford could set up a system, you know, that allows you an application that allows you to create purchase orders and record them into the database. And why? That is life changing. That is life changing because everybody in the organization who needs access to that purchase order can get access directly from that database instead of looking at paper copies. The purchase order was then sent to the vendor in by, by fax. It doesn't matter. At the time, there was no electronic data interchange yet, but never mind. It was sent by fax. The vendor will deliver the products eventually to the, to the warehouse. And here's the trick. They said, look, why should we receive something that we have not ordered? We, can, we should only accept to receive things that we have ordered. If we do that, then we will make sure that there is zero discrepancy between what we have ordered and what we have received. And that is very key, and it has nothing to do with technology. So it's, it's, it's something, it's a principle you can apply now as much as you could apply in the 1980s. You know, detect the defects at the source. If you receive something and you do not or have not ordered it, then you should just reject it, or you should just try to resolve the problem straight away. Generally speaking, if there is one thing I would like to retain you is that defects, problems need to be detected as early as possible. A process that detects defects as early as possible is a much more robust and efficient process than a process where defects are left hanging towards the end. You will see it in every process. If you are into software engineering, you will very quickly understand in your profession that detecting your defects in your software as early as possible makes it much simpler to fix them than just leaving all the defects for later. Okay, coming back to the example, at this point in time when the products were delivered by a truck at the warehouse of Ford, the person in the warehouse will access the database and will retrieve the corresponding purchase order. So they will require that the the delivery person, the, the, the vendor, sends with the delivery person the copy of the purchase order so they could look at the purchase order number, 
enter it into the database and say, yes, we order these products. Second, they will immediately record the fact that we have received this product. So we say, yes, we have received these products of this line item of this purchase order. They will record that into the database. From that point on, the database has a record of the fact that a purchase order was issued and that the products corresponding to that purchase order have been received. And what? If we have ordered something and we have received it, we know that we are liable to pay it. So what accounts payable will do is every so often they will proactively, let's say once or twice every week, they will proactively retrieve from the database all the purchase orders that have been issued and for which the, the products have been received, and they will prepare a payment for those purchase orders. So they, in principle, they don't even need the invoice to do it. They know that they have to pay it because it was ordered and it was received. There is a small caveat in that. So that is that this pattern where you pay on the basis of the fact that you have ordered and received something is called evaluated receipts settlement. Settlement means payment. So payment on the basis of that you have evaluated that something has been received. There is a small caveat, of course, um, that a Invoices is a an invoice is a required document from a from a legal perspective. Uh, tax office requires businesses to produce invoices uh, in, and to keep records very strictly keep records of those invoices for the purposes of tax auditing. Uh, so they had to adjust a little bit this idea to fit reality. And instead of accounts payable just making a payment, accounts payable, what they did is that when they found that a purchase order had been delivered, they will ask the vendor for an invoice with a very specific amount. So they made something called a request for invoice, which means like, please send me an invoice for this purchase order, this line item, this amount. And then the vendor will produce the invoice on demand when accounts payable ask for it. And that way, when the invoice comes, it was already checked. We know that this invoice has to be paid and we just pay. So it, bec it becomes much simpler. So if you see in this alternative, and this is, this is funny, this is no, escargo. In this alternative design, accounts payable is almost doing nothing. They are just creating, extracting a report from a database with the purchase orders that have been received. And they are then asking the vendor to produce the corresponding invoice. And when the invoice comes, they just check that the invoice matches the request for invoice and they pay. So it's pretty straightforward and it's not error prone. So you do not spend too much time handling errors and exceptions. The outcome of these changes to the process, meaning the digitization by means of a database and the, um, the, the idea of detecting defects and avoiding defects as early as possible at the warehouse, those changes led to a 75% reduction in the headcount. So they could bring their 500 person plus persons accounts payable department to a much more reasonable size. Uh, it also improved a lot their records of how much they have ordered and how much material they were consuming to produce their cars, uh, more accurate financial information about what, how much they were paying for different parts, uh, a faster a purchase acquisition, which means that if I am a superintendent, and I need to order something, I can get it in two days time, uh, and also less penalties for overdue payments. Um, and what do we learn out of this? So remember the starting point was that there was a, an IT consulting company proposing to automate the existing process. So leave that process as is, just introduce automation to automate the way purchase orders delivery receipts and invoices were matched. 
And they were proposing that this will lead to a 20% reduction in headcount. Now with this redesign, they led to a 75% reduction in headcount. And what do we learn is that there's, you, you always, I mean, coming from your generation of digital natives, I can understand that you always will have the reflect of auto, the reflex of automating something. Just bear in mind that there is something better, something more efficient than automating and is not doing it. In other words, make sure you automate what you have to do and not what you don't have to. So the, 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 the weakness of the original proposal from the IT consulting firm in this case study is that they propose to automate the three-way matching task, the task where you have invoices on paper, you have purchase orders on papers, and you have delivery receipts on paper, and you have to match them and find discrepancies. And, but it turns out that task is not needed because all that that task is doing is to process information that was already available before. So the fact that we received the product that we order is a piece of information that we already knew before. So there is no need to do this complicated three-way matching. You can just add a source in the place where you receive the products, say uh, these products have been received and they have been ordered and mark them ready for payment. So don't automate things that don't need to be done or as uh, Michael Hammer, who was the developer of this business process reengineering approach, put it, don't automate, obliterate, meaning first forget about your process, find out how it should be, then automate the process as it should be. And so Michael Hammer and his team, through a series of such experiences in American companies, came up with a um, sort of method consisting of a number of principles and it's called business process reengineering. There are in total eight principles, but I have reduced them to five, which I will introduce to you. The first one, and this is something I'm sure you will be able to capture and you need to capture, is very important for the rest of the course, is this principle. Your process should capture information once, only once, and at the source. That's the main thing here. So uh, the second principle is any, any place in a process where you have a task that where you are just doing nothing else than processing information, like moving information from one screen to another screen or from one window to another window is probably it's a wrong process design. A good process design is one where capturing information is part of the work that you are doing. It's not that you have people just entering data. That is like, that, that's, that's dumb, that's wrong. You need to make it that, you know, as part of the work that you do, you handle information. Three, this is a tricky one to grab. Make sure that, the, that, a, that you align work with incentives, specifically that you give work to those who have an incentive that this work gets done. Or put in other terms, have those people who consume the output of the process drive the process. You have to make sure that every task is in the desk of someone who has an incentive to do it. Everywhere, incentives should be perfectly aligned. That's something that you will, you will discuss during the practice session today where you have a scenario where there is a misalignment of incentives. You will get a scenario in your practice session where there is an actor in the process that does not have an incentive to do something because the incentives are misaligned. So always think about this principle, work has, be, has to be aligned with incentives. Do not give work to someone who does not have an incentive to do it. 
naturally they will give a low priority and it won't get done. In, in, um, in very often we have this saying that says, if you want to get something done, give it to a busy person. What it means fundamentally is the person who has an incentive to do things, who is really engaged, is the one who does it quicker. So that's what principle three tells you. Fourth, and this is a little bit more abstract, is you need to make sure in a process there are lots of decisions that need to be made. You know, should we reject this invoice or should we accept it? Should we ask the supplier to revise the invoice or should we ask the warehouse to revise the delivery receipts? So there are lots of decisions to be made. And what's, what principle number four tells you is make those decisions move them to the point where the work is performed. That's the first part. So make sure that your decision is at the point in the process where the information that is required to make the decision is fresh. In other words, make decisions on the basis of freshly acquired information. If you just decided, if you just found out that something was paid, and so it was delivered and we had ordered it, that is when you are making the decision of paying it. That is where you are making the decision of uh, um, accepting the invoice that will come for that product. And secondly, sometimes it's not necessary to check on a case by case basis for every instance of the process you perform a check, for the next instance you perform the same check, for the next one you perform it again, etc. Sometimes it's more efficient to just move the verification steps out of your process, let your process flow as fast as possible, and then make what we call random checks to detect if people are executing the process the way they should. I'm going to now illustrate these principles by means of examples. Ah, sorry, I meant there was a fifth principle that I forgot. When you have the many people in different locations of the organization doing the same thing is very efficient to just put them to work in the same team, virtually or physically. Um, what that means, for example, in Ford, there were many different people across the organization doing the same thing, which was handling invoices. And instead of having 10 teams of five people handling instance invoices all over the place, having a single place where all the people who handle invoices work together, and that could be a virtual group, that makes it more efficient. Why? Because if you have the larger your resource pool, the larger the set of people who can do some task is, the more they are able to ensure you low waiting times with high uh, resource utilization. Let me put it concrete. If you have 50 people doing some task, so they, they just do certain type of task, they can have a resource utilization of 95%, meaning they get heaps of work relative to their capacity, and yet the waiting times for a work to be done is very, very small. So the more you have people to do something, the more there will be somebody available to do the next work that arrives. So larger resource pools allows you to ensure lower waiting times with higher resource utilization. This principle, you should keep it in mind for the homework that you will get, not the current one, but just the next one. It's one of the tricks that you can do. You, know, you have a pharmacy and there are stores that are distributed geographically. And in every store, there are some people doing exactly the same thing. If you could make them work as a team, you know, then you will have more capacity because you will have like 50 or 100 people handling a certain type of task than if you let them completely distributed. And technology, collaboration technology, allows you to do that. It allows you to build bigger pools of resources. 
Let me exemplify these principles. First, capture information once, only once, and at the source. Um, that's the main principle of BPR. And it means that in every process, you should think about two things. Where do you put the data? Put it in a shared data source where all process workers have access to the data instantly. Don't send around data. Be, and it doesn't matter via email or via whatever, data should not be sent. Data that is required to execute the process should go into a shared database system. That way, everybody at any point in time in the organization that needs to access it, access it. The second aspect of principle number one is what we call self-service. Everywhere in your process where it's possible, make sure that the, the persons who produce the information, for example, the customers are the ones who produce the purchase order. The customers who produce the purchase orders should be the one entering the data. Don't have a design where someone needs to buy something and gives a phone call to somebody else to order it and the other person orders it. Try to make it such that this person can enter the order directly. The self-service is a wonderful thing. It allows you to offload work to the customer and the customer actually has then more control on things because they know exactly what they are ordering. And that's why self-service systems, web-based self-service systems, where you can go and enter orders by yourself or you can enter a claim or a complaint by yourself are so powerful because they, they allow you, the customer, to take control of the process, to have visibility of the process and to ensure that you are entering the correct data. Principle number two means, and don't make it that there is a task where you are only entering data, embed data entry into real work. So uh, one of the key steps in the redesign process that we saw before was this one. When I receive a product, I am getting a piece of information and it's that this product that was ordered has been received. Instead of printing a delivery receipt and sending it to somebody else who will later capture the information that we have received this product that we ordered, have it enter straight during the receiving. So I receive something and during the receive of something, I scan a barcode, I retrieve the corresponding purchase order and I click this purchase order has been delivered. So the, as part of me receiving a product in the warehouse, I am also entering information into my database to say, this product has been received. The, so the, the information about receipt of the product is captured as part of receiving the product and not later. Don't let information arrive and be captured later. Capture the information into your, in the shared data source straight away. Third, have those who use the output of the process drive the process. This is a bit of an abstract principle now. Let me illustrate it by a, a means of a, an example, a few examples. First, um, in, a, in a business process where a company A buys something from a company B, usually in a traditional process design, company A asks company B, you know, I need X amount of this product. And that design is a bit problematic. So the design where when I need something, I need to ask you to buy something is problematic, particularly in the context of repeated purchases. Let me imagine, for example, that I am a supply chain manager at a Rimi supermarket or a Tallinn Kaubamaya Selver supermarket, the Selver division of Tallinn Kaubamaya. So Selver has to buy products from certain suppliers on a regular basis, daily or weekly or two times per week. For example, toilet paper. They need to constantly be ordering toilet paper from a producer, say, Grite in Lithuania. 
Um, and they need to be, so in a traditional process design, you will have like silver sending purchase orders to Grite to say, please send me X amount of toilet paper to this distribution center uh, in Southern Estonia. Um, principle number three basically is telling you that is kind of wrong. Why? Because who has the incentive that this process happens and is completed? as quickly as possible. So this is a purchasing process from the perspective of Silver. Silver is buying from Grite. Who has the incentive to make sure that this transaction happens? N not so much Silver, although they do, they do want to have that toilet paper in the shelf. But the one who has the most incentive for this to happen is Grite, the provider. They want to sell that toilet paper. That's their business, selling toilet paper. So principle number three tells you, make the company that, drive, that, that, that wants, that has the incentive to execute this process, let them drive the process. And, and that in the last uh, 20, 30 years has led to a very interesting design for business processes in a B2B e-commerce setting which is called Vendor Managed Inventory Control or VMI. In Vendor Managed Inventory Control, I am seller and what I do is that I, I sign a contract with Grite where I say like, look, at this endpoint, API endpoint, you can check how much toilet paper of Grite I have in my different distribution centers. When that you must ensure that I always have between this minimum amount and this maximum amount of toilet papers in my distribution centers. So you must ensure that. And now Grite sets up a system that is constantly checking how much toilet paper there is in the different distribution centers of stores of silver. And when they see that it's a little bit low, then they will immediately dispatch more toilet paper. So it's Grite that is triggering the process of dispatching the toilet paper and it's not server asking it. And why that works? Because Grite has an incentive to make sure that the toilet paper is delivered uh, on time at the right point uh, uh, to, the, to, 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 uh, to the server shops. So you turn around, principle three tells you, make sure that the work is driven by the actor that has the most incentive to be driving that work. Another, actually this principle has been pushed even further in the past 20 years uh, with the arrival of uh, a RFID technology. RFID are these little chips that you attach to objects and when they pass through a place, you know, they get detected. It's like a beep and then uh, that, record is sent to a, a, a database somewhere. So in many, many organizations, there are several situations where there is a supplier. For example, I sell screws, screws, you know, for different purposes. And there is a factory in Tartu that consumes lots of screws. They are producing stuff and they need lots of screws. So traditionally, how the process works, the company in Tartu will say, hey, please send me X amount of this screw and X amount of that screw and X amounts of that other type of screw. And I will send those products, say, on a weekly or a monthly basis. Um, principle number three of BPR, have those who use the output of the process, drive the process, tells you, no, 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 it should be the company that sells the screws that should be driving the process. And one way to do it is as follows. The company that sells screws, they put a bunch of screws in a container, in a, in a truck container. They hang it to a truck. Of course, they don't do it themselves. They get a transportation provider to do it. And the transportation provider takes the screws to the factory where they will be used, to their customer's factory. They leave the, the, the container inside, and the container has a door. When you open that door, you are an employee of the factory and you need screws. You open the door of the, the container that belongs to your supplier. 
you enter, you grab the boxes of screws that you need, and you scan them when you exit. And only when you scan them on exit, only then the transaction has occurred. I have, I, the manufacturing company, have purchased this box of screws from the screw producing company. So you see how um, the screw producing company is making as easy as possible that the consumer is able to scan products out. Um, and it's also kind of done also between supermarkets, like, you know, like I am greedy, I put a bunch of toilet paper, uh, and whenever you want to move them to a store, you scan them, and that's where you have bought them. It's like sending a purchase order, or, or better for, for the supermarket, but not for Grite. Only when a customer picks a box of Grite or a, a bag of Grite toilet paper from the from the shelves in the supermarket and they scan it through the, the, uh, the exit cashier, only then the toilet paper moves from belonging to Grite to belonging to Selver for one millisecond. And then of course, Selver immediately sells it to the, the customer. This is an extreme form of scan-based trading where the product belongs to the supplier, in this case, Grite, manufacturer of toilet paper, until such time as Selver sells it to the customer, uh, which means that Selver becomes a real estate company. It provides shelf space where producers are putting products and then customers are grabbing them from those shelves and scanning them uh, at the exit of the supermarket. And only at that point in time, the producer of that product gets the purchase order like, yeah, please, now you can invoice me for that toilet paper that was just sold in my supermarket. So that's the principle of scan basic training. Everything that I'm saying in this principle number three is about push work to the actor that has the incentive to do it. For example, in an insurance claims process, don't do this. Client has to ask for a quote to repair their car. Client sends a claim to the insurer. Insurer uh, authorizes the payment. Client pays to the repairer and client gets reimbursed. This is a very poor design of a process that is prone to a lot of errors, a lot of delays, a lot of customer complaints, dissatisfied customers. Why? because the process is being driven by the client, but the, he is the one who is driving everything. It's like he's the one who is interacting with everybody, but it's not the client that should be driving this process because they are not the ones that have an incentive to make this process happen. If you think about it, among these three actors, client, insurer, or repairer, let's say a, 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 a company that, repairs glasses or uh, windscreens in cars, the one that has an incentive to make sure that this transaction happens is the repairer. They are the ones who want to make sure that they repair your car because that's how they get money by repairing cars. So you have to redesign this type of process so that is the glass vendor the one who repairs, the one who wants to get stuff repaired and gets paid for it, they are the ones who will drive the process. So as a client, you will just go there, drop off your car, say, sorry, I broke my windscreen yesterday. Uh, can you please repair it? And the approved glass vendor will say, yes, sure. Are you insured? Yeah, I am insured with this company and this is my insurance policy number. Uh, the approved glass vendor then makes a claim to the insurer, hey, Someone from your, one of your customers has broken their glass. You know, if I repair it, would you pay? The insurer says yes, and they pay eventually after the glass has been repaired, of course. And now the client is not driving anything. The one who is driving the process is the glass vendor. And this is the reason why also um, when you go to a pharmacy, the pharmacy is the one that handles in many cases, depends on the country, etc. In many cases, the pharmacy is the one that handles the reimbursement from the healthcare insurance provider. 
um, because they are the ones who have the incentive to get that money from the insurer. Um, the, the customer wants to get their drugs at the lowest possible price. The pharmacy wants to sell them. Uh, they want to sell them at the best possible price. They want to make sure that you buy more. So they are the ones who have the most incentive to make sure that the insurance company pays to them their due. You pay to them their due and they sell you as many medicines as you need. Principle number four tells, you, tells us, make sure you always, every decision that you make in the process into the part of the process and is not stopping the process. Uh, that means you have to empower workers in the process to make decisions themselves. Don't, don't make it that, ah, oh, the workers in the process cannot make decision. Every time they need a decision, they have to ask somebody else to do it. Uh, instead, give the information that the workers require to do decisions themselves, give them the guidelines, and then, um, and then check those decisions on a periodic basis to make sure that company policies are being followed when those decisions are being taken and to make people accountable for the decisions they take. Um, for example, in this equipment rental process we have seen in the past, there is a little bit of a design flaw. And that is that when I submit an equipment rental as a site engineer, the clerk, once they have found the equipment, they have to ask for approval from the works engineer. And the works engineer has to reply back and that back and forth between the clerk and the works engineer and from the works engineer back to the clerk, that introduces delays into the process. And these delays are causing all sorts of other problems down the road. So principle number four of BPR will tell you, replace this, make it that the site engineer or the clerk are able to make the decision on approving this purchase. The works engineer just gives the guidelines to make this decision. They don't have to be involved in every single decision point. Principle number one of BPM tells you that the consumer of the process, the user of the process should be given as much as possible self-service access to order to start the process. So the site engineer, Instead of like filling in a form in PDF, sending it to the clerk who is the one who checks if the equipment is available or not, as much as possible, we should make sure that the site engineer is able to directly query the catalogs of available uh, equipment and that they can click on one and say, I want to order this tractor or this bulldozer and I want it by tomorrow. So give a self-service interface as much as you can to the actor who starts the process so that they have full control and visibility of the process. That's principle number one. Principle number three, which means give the, put the work in the place where there is an incentive, will tell you to consider the option where frequently used stock, frequently used equipment is already there at the construction site ready to be rented. For example, if you need from time to time water pumps in a construction site to pull out water out of holes, uh, instead of every time I need a water pump, I send a purchase order to the equipment rental provider. I am not the one who has the incentive to rent that equipment, that, that, uh, a, a, that water pump. The one who has the incentive to rent is the equipment rental company. They should have the stock that I frequently need in some sort of container in the construction site, such that I, as a site engineer, if I need a water pump, I just go, I open, I grab the water pump, I scan it, I close the door, and that water pump, and I use it for as long as I need, and then I put it back. And then I pay for the time I used it. So that design, that way of renting is much more e effective because the, the, the customer who is the one, the customer has an easy time just consuming the thing. The producer is the one that is driving the process. The producer is the one that is making sure that in your construction site, 
there is everything you need in order to perform your construction work. So in this equipment rental process, in a way, according to business process engineering, in the ASIS process, there is something fundamentally wrong, is that the process is being driven by build it, the construction company. But the one who has the incentive to make this process happen is the rental company. So principle number three tells you, make it as much as possible that is the rental company that is driving the process. Finally, principle number four, as I said before, tells you that the site engineer should be empowered with the authority to rent equipment. It shouldn't be that every time that the site engineer needs to rent an equipment, they have to ask the clerk, who then asks the works engineer, who then say yes, and then the clerk sends a purchase order. It should be possible for the site engineer to decide by themselves that they need to rent something and within certain bounds and certain instructions that they have been given to be able to do it straight away. The last principle is principle number five. If you have multiple resources dispersed in different teams who are doing the same work, bring them together physically or virtually. So because larger resource pools means less waiting times. Um, so if you have, just to give you a hint, some technicians that are doing the same type of work everywhere, and this work can be shared between all of them, make it shared whenever that is possible. And modern collaboration technology allows you to do that. You can have virtual teams with people located in different places, connecting and doing tasks corresponding to the common work that they have together. So that concludes my presentation about business process reengineering, which is the first of two methods for business process redesign that we will see in this course. Next week, I will introduce you another uh, a technique for business process redesign called heuristic process redesign.